<laughs> yeah, it's working now? Yeah. Okay. So the joke was private. Uh, <laughs> so I think it's the only talk, or may maybe the only talk of the day, which is not on Bayesian optimization. There will be a, a second talk tomorrow on Bayesian optimization from my side. Uh, but this is more a follow-up to what uh, Nicola was uh, telling you about kernel design. So this is joint work, based on joint works with a number of co-authors. I will mention them uh, throughout the talk. Quickly, the motivation, because most of you now are acquainted with the notions, uh, we want to work with a black box function f. Typically, uh, the input values live in a compact subset of R to the D, and the output can be scalar or uh, vector valued. Here it will be scalar because we want to optimize. What does a function f has to do with Gaussian process or Gaussian random fields? Because as Neil mentioned, there are different vocabularies depending on the on the community. I I I, I, I speaking of GPs in terms of G or F most of the time. Um, what do they have to do with black boxes? Now you're aware after this uh, excellent lesson. Uh, they can serve as, uh, as prior on function space. So an example of uh, an interpolation, you have some red points that stem from f, and now there is a function underlying, but you don't know it. You put a prior, and then you can draw conditional simulations. You can draw many of them, and if you take the mean of this conditional simulation, you will find a curve, which is a predictor, which we call the Kriging mean, uh, in spatial statistics, we call the Gaussian process predictor, I guess, in machine learning. And then you will have this pointwise uh, confidence interval uh, that gives you uh, some, some confidence uh, uh, on, on what happens between the points. So in spatial statistics, uh, originally, I mean, Kriging originally refers to doing a linear prediction of a field that you have observed at a given uh, set of locations, x1, xn. And so this, this field, z, is, is kind of a random function, actually. So this is a typical notation for, for, for z. And actually, uh, what we are doing now, uh, which means predicting the field based on these observations, um, is related to Gaussian process regression, of course, but it's also related to interpolation splines and uh, regularization in reproducing kernel hidden space. So these are facets of somehow uh, the same problem. Let me give you some uh, references. So of course there is the, the, the book uh, GPML. Here for those who have interest in splines and also there are many interesting things uh, uh, touching upon uh, periodic kernels, for instance in, in Waba, uh, Stein is uh, covering Triggering and uh, giving also s different viewpoints, and and Bellini and Tomagnon is a, is a is a very rich book about OKHS. So to take an example, in 2D, uh, now you have this this uh, nine red points together with the surface, which is the prediction, and you have a Kriging variance or uh, the, the 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 prediction variance that tells you basically that you are knowing what happens at the point, but you're not knowing what happens between the points. And the way the uncertainty uh, varies in space is, is uh, anisotropic in this case. So this is driven by uh, 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 the kernel, covariance kernel, which has been chosen a priori. Here it's the stationary anisotropic Matton kernel uh, with parameters estimated by maximum likelihood. And so in, in this talk, uh, we will be concerned about the implications of choosing the kernel. So in order to insist a little bit more uh, on the importance of the kernel, um, let's recall the Kriging equations or the GP equations in case where you have a kernel k and a constant mean mu for the random field. So the mean and the, the conditional covariance are given by this formula. The reason why I'm giving this formula is not uh, to, 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 to insist uh, in, in, in detail on them, it's more to insist on the fact that you have a vector of covariances, a matrix of covariances, the vector of observations, vector of covariances, matrix of covariances, and so on. And the letter that you see everywhere is K. Okay? So K 
the kernel K is really uh, the, the crucial ingredient in this kind of methods. So if you assume that mu is known, so the, the, the constant mean, or that it is uh, assumed uh, to have an improper uniform prior, then you've got this, this very uh, practical and interesting result that the posterior distribution of the field knowing the observations is still a Gaussian random field which mean and conditional covariance are given by these equations okay so once you have that you can do a lot a couple of references on this Bayesian uh, approach because now we are not doing only prediction we are also having a posterior distribution uh, I think one of the uh, seminal papers on the topic is uh, the nine, uh, 89 paper by Omri and uh, Halvorsen on the Bayesian bridge between simple and universal Kriging. But you have also this uh, paper in technometrics by Hancock and Stein in 93, of course, from uh, a different uh, perspective, uh, the works of O'Hagan. Uh, this is a 2006 reference, but there have, have been a lot uh, since the, 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 the 70s, I guess. and. Finally, th there has been some recent work uh, in the mathematical statistics community by Van der Waart, Van Zanten, and other authors on uh, non-parametric uh, viewpoints on that. So coming back to our function, once you have chosen the kernel and estimated the parameters, you can perform what is referred to as conditional simulations, I exactly the same as the curves we displayed at the beginning. Here I'm just drawing some samples of the function um, knowing the observations, okay? So now we are gonna focus on this kernel K. So the kernel K is mapping any couple of points xx prime from the domain to some number, which is a covariance between zx and zx prime, and discussing some notions of invariance for K. So what you know, probably, is that uh, the notion of second order stationarity on k, so basically your k depends on x minus x prime, means that if you translate x and x prime simultaneously, you don't change the covariance. The notion of isotropy means that if you rotate x and x prime simultaneously, you don't change the covariance. Okay? That doesn't mean that your function is invariant by translation. Because it, if it would be the case, it would be a constant. And the rotation invariance doesn't mean that your function is radial. Okay? It's something which is about the distribution. So here we want to focus on functional properties of random field path, so on the realizations of Z, which are driven by K, both in the Gaussian case and also maybe in uh, second-order settings. Which leads me to the second part. Um, so here I will speak about invariances, so different kind of uh, structural priors that you can impose on Z by playing on K. And finally, if time allows, we will speak about sensitivity analysis, ANOVA decompositions, and how you can also impose some structure on uh, the dependence of F on the different variables via K. Okay, so assume Assume that for some reasons, for instance, physical reasons, F is known to be invariant under some transformations. That you know it's symmetrical, or that you know a certain group of rotations is leaving the response unchanged. Then I think you want to incorporate that in your GP model. Is it possible? So is it possible to incorporate a structural prior like that into a random field model. So let's first review a property which has been obsessing me uh, since my PhD. Uh, if you take G, a finite group, which is acting measurably on D, so you have a set of transformations, a set of rotations, a set of translations, whatever, which map any point X to G point X. So you take an element of the group, an element of the space, of the input space and you map it to G point X and with the properties of group actions then you can you have the, the following equivalence you have that for all X in the domain 
the probability that Zx is invariant over the orbit of the action is equal to 1 if and only if the kernel is invariant with respect to its left argument. Okay, black magic for the moment. What does it mean? It means that you can have symmetrical path if your kernel is <coughs> argument-wise invariant. Not the same way we spoke before, where you had the rotation invariance or translation invariant on the two arguments, but only with respect to the left or the right argument, which is a lot stronger. Okay? So this, this was uh, finally published in a, pa in a 2012 paper. I will give you an example. Here I consider uh, the action of a group of order two, no, of, of order four. So I have two symmetries, symmetries with respect to the first bisector and with respect to the second bisector. And I'm showing you constructively that you can define GPs which are symmetrical uh, by simulations. So these guys are GP simulations where the kernel is invariant argument-wise under this uh, group of symmetries. So it's possible not only to do GP simulation, but also to do GP prediction, GP conditional simulations, embedding this kind of structural prior. If you want more, uh, then I invite you to have a look at the curl GP package that we recently released and where some help functions uh, are uh, considering this kind of kernels. Another kind of invariance, which is an echo to the presentation of Nicolas, is uh, <coughs> additivity. It took us a lot of time to understand why additivity is an invariance, but actually it does. So additivity here means that a multivariate function can be written down as a sum of univariate functions. You can imagine that if you have this kind of structure, then you can spare yourself a lot of calculations because your function boils down to something very simple, even if it is high dimensional. Basically, you can boil down from exponential to linear costs. So, Nicolas has considered this kind of kernels where k is a sum of univariate kernels in his thesis and came up with nice realizations. These are draws of GP which have this kind of kernel. Uh, so, I invite you to have a look. Maybe there is a laser pointer. Is this a laser pointer? Yes? In the middle, yeah, logical. Uh, then, yeah, you have the thesis of Nicolas. And meanwhile, we realized that there was uh, some people uh, here in the UK, especially David Duvno, uh, uh, Nikish Narasmussen, but Duvno also c continued this work in, in, in his PhD thesis. Uh, about additive pro Gaussian processes. So this is not exactly the same meaning that we gave to the word additive, but in the end, we manipulated a lot of common concepts. And then uh, Nicolas published that uh, together uh, with, with Olivia and I in, 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 the, in this uh, French journal. And finally, after a while, we finally understood what is the common point between additivity and group actions. So I spent some time trying to figure out how additivity boils down to a group action and I was uh, unsuccessful. And then I realized that actually there was an, an uh, overarching concept that was uh, of which the two were subcases. This overarching concept is the, ca is, the, is the concept of composition operators. Composition of compo uh, composition operators. Combinations of composition operators. So let's consider a function f and uh, a, a function v that maps a point x onto a point v of x. Doesn't have to be a subjection, actually. Uh, so a function v that takes a point of the domain and returns a point of the domain and, and denote by tv the operator that composes f with v. Okay, so you're just doing a change of time or a change of space inside of your function f. And then you have this nice property for any centered second order random field, doesn't need to be Gaussian, uh, k is t invariant, so meaning that 
the com combination of composition operators leaves the kernel k invariant as a function of one variable if and only if <coughs> the field is invariant with probability one. Okay? And so, so finally, we, we could apply this principle to additivity and, and not only uh, show that the kernel of Nicolas gave birth to additive path, which was already shown, but give an equivalence. So the path of Z are additive if and only if the kernel writes that way. And that way is slightly more general than the, the family of kernels of Nicolas because you don't have a sum of univariate kernel, you have a double sum of kernels which actually uh, stand for the cross correlation between the different additive paths. Now, applying that to, uh, additi to, to the group actions, we also found a way of uh, translating the group action into a combination of com composition operators and to apply the general results, giving that Z is phi invariant if and only if the kernel K is argument wise invariant. Then we, we thought, okay, this result here, they are actually uh, not assuming any Gaussianity. If we assume Gaussianity, then probably we can do more. And it turned out, using some very nice property of Gaussian fields, and namely the low isometry, uh, that we could do more in the Gaussian case, <coughs> because actually there is a Hilbert space, L of Z, which is associated with a random field, a Gaussian random field, and there is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Maybe we can come back to this at the end if we have questions before or after the lunch. And there is a nice isometry between these two spaces. And based on this isometry, we could, given an operator T that satisfies some technical conditions, we could uh, construct an operator curly T on the RKHS, which corresponds to straight T in some way. So this is the identification formula somehow, and show the following result, which is that the, the path or, or T invariant, if and only if curly T is the identity on the RKHS. And the nice thing is that then we could move to more complicated operators, provided they, they fulfill this condition. And this is what I will show you now before we go to sensitivity analysis, is that we can go a lot further than additivity and group actions, we can go for uh, harmonicity, for instance, or we can go for uh, having, having integral zero on the path of a Gaussian process by playing on a kernel. So uh, there is a preprint available, was put on, on archive, I think, two years ago, and now we are currently, uh, we have restructured this paper and it's currently in revision. Okay, so some examples of what you can do in the Gaussian case. Take a measure on D, such that uh, the square root of K U U is integrable. Then you can show that a random field, a Gaussian random field Z has centered path if and only if the kernel is centered as a function of one argument, whatever the value of the other argument, okay? For instance, if you take an arbitrary kernel K, then you can create a centered kernel by using this formula that will still be a positive definite kernel or semi-definite semi positive. Second example is take the Laplace equation. So you, s you know that a, a function for which the Laplace operator, I mean, delta of F is equal to zero is called harmonic. Then if you, if you consider a kernel for which, for any value of the second argument, the Laplacian of the kernel as a function of the first argument is equal to zero, your path will be harmonic. Okay. So for instance, if you take these kernels, which was used in a, in a deterministic setup by Shabak in 2009, which has the property of being argument-wise harmonic, then all your path will be harmonic. So a couple of examples. Here we have simulated some path with zero integral just by playing on the kernel and here we have simulated the path uh, of a harmonic path, uh, of a harmonic uh, GRF. There are some nicer um, images coming up, uh, hopefully in, a, in, a, in, the, in the paper we are, we are uh, revising at the moment. So 
now you can apply it for prediction. So this is an example where you have a function. Let me see. The function is in red. And we pretend to know in advance that the integral of this function is equal to 0. So here we have some observations which turn out to be on the sides. And so, of course, the GP model in the general case, so in black here, taking a standard kernel is, is, is not accurate because it misses this bump. But if you know that the integral is 0, then you need to compensate for this low value here by having a bump in the middle, which is what the kernel with zero integral is doing automatically. Second, we, we interpolated a function, a harmonic function. So we really took a harmonic test case. We took some analytic functions. We took some simulated uh, harmonic path and tried to interpolate them. And here, what you can see is that uh, you can get a pretty accurate um, interpolation with a few points if you have the harmonicity conditions because it's such a strong requirement on the function that you kill the uncertainty relatively fast which is something you want to do if you really know it's harmonic of course you have questions yes mm. so um you talk just talked about zero integral kernels. yes well for me kernels are positive so you you're using kernels which take negative values also so kernels don't have to be positive. Yeah. They have to be semi-definite positive, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean they have to be positive. They can have negative values. Okay. What, what is an example of a kernel which takes negative values? Well, you know, Simpler. the simplest you can take, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. consider a covariance matrix two by two. So it's a kernel defined on a two-point set. Mm -hmm. It can have negative values. Yeah, right. Okay. okay? Yes. It might be a lack of my imagination, but, but can you give us an example of a situation in which you would actually use this, this model or something? Right. Well, so what I will present next is probably uh, partly a response to that. Uh, for, for the zero integral, uh, I think Rich has disappeared, but he told me that he has a case where he needs to impose the zero integral condition. <laughs> so we are happy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for uh, for the for the symmetry, have you have a case. Yeah. So see. <laughs> for for the symmetry, uh, I really invite you to have a look at the paper because when I present this stuff with the symmetry. Many people spontaneously think, if he knows it's symmetrical, then why bother with modeling over the whole space? Just take a right part of the space, a fundamental domain of the group action, and, and restrict to it. But it turns out that you have boundary effects, and that if you know there is some symmetry, maybe it's better uh, to incorporate the symmetry and so that, so that you know somehow that there are points on the other side of the symmetry axis, rather than just focusing on a part of the space, in which case you will come back to the mean at the boundary at the symmetry axis. So th there are some subtle effects that makes it worth not to drop, uh, not, not to simplify the problem too fast. But I agree that it's, you, have, you have solved half of the problem if you can come up with the kernel that has the structural properties of your choice. It's just a pity not to incorporate them if you can. Yes. Oh, sorry. So, so can you can you can find your integral is equal to zero. Can you also can you also construct something where you can where you know the integral is equal to one? It's not the same problem. Okay, so you can't have it. That you affect the mean. If you do that you affect the mean. It's not only a covariance issue. But we can discuss about that. Yeah, yeah the, about the derivatives of the uh, function. So, uh, for instance, I want the, the function to be like say, uh, two times its range. So, uh, should I call this uh, constructed kernel? So, my term is this kernel, right? 
so yeah, Matern is nice. If it's only the only requirement is being differentiable, then Matern is a nice family among the stationary ones. About the Lipschitz constant, uh, I'm not sure you can do much with a hard bound in the Gaussian framework. Because uh, the support of the distribution of the norm of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the gradient will be infinite. And so you, you need to escape the Gaussian, Gaussianity if you want to impose a strict bound. I guess we can discuss that as well. Good. So monitoring the time should be okay. Um, so now we, we will apply these ideas to a very specific kind of invariance, which turns out to be a degeneracy. So now we, at the beginning, we spoke about invariances, and now we realize that invariance degeneracy is the same thing in our case. So, which is related to sensitivity analysis. Again, there is a vocabulary uh, challenge because I think that sensitivity analysis doesn't mean the same depending on the community. <coughs> so maybe you're speaking more about feature extraction? Well, I, you know, it's all about how much machine learning. So I thought it, when I say I'm the computational biology, meaning which is when people effectively explore that, they don't call it posterior, but they look at how when the parameter changes, So, how do you call the the issue of choosing a subset of influential variables? Uh, feature selection. Feature selection. So let's do feature yeah, selection. We've seen the sensitivity analysis, but it's a variable changing, which is another type of sensitivity analysis. Yeah. yeah so absolutely. So, the ANOVA decomposition, the idea, take them some mathematical assumptions. You have a you have d, which write as a product. So every variable is living, in, for instance, in an interval. And then you endow each of these intervals with an individual probability measure. It can take uniform for instance. And we consider a function which is quite integrable. So assuming, for instance, that you have a continuous f of a, a compact domain is, is nice. The functional ANOVA which is also referred to as the sobol hofding decomposition. There are also other names around because there are many people who have worked on this idea. Consists in expanding f into a sum of orthogonal terms of increasing complexity in the sense that you will say, OK, in f, I have a constant part. And then I can extract an additive function. And then I can extract a sum of function that depends only on two variables. And then I, conti I can continue like this, and I will have an equality in the end. Okay, But the problem is that you will have an equality, but you will have two to, two to the power d terms. Okay, So typically, if you have yeah, 10 dimensions, you can imagine what's happening. Uh, the very nice thing with this setup is that once, once you have defined it, then you can, you can look at the norm, at the square norm of f, and you can decompose it as a sum of square norms of the, the terms fu, and quantify the influence of each variable or group of variables by taking a ratio. So you're looking basically at a ratio of variances. Okay? So you're counting what is the proportion of variance explained by variable 1, 2, 3, and so on, but in a non-parametric way, not like in linear regression. <coughs> it's something completely non-parametric because the way we define these FUs, which is not clear yet, uh, doesn't rely on a linear procedure. It's really a kind of perfect L2 decomposition. OK. So these guys are referred to as, as the Sobol indices, and there is a lot of research going on about Sobol indices in engineering and uh, related subjects. So let's consider a simple test function over uh, a square, okay? Sine x1 plus x1 times cos x2. 
and see what's happening if I apply this decomposition to the function. So after a bit of calculations, and we will see the formula in a moment, you can work out the value of f empty set. f empty set is the constant part of f. So we extracted the constant part, which is here, this red function. And then we could calculate f1, f2, and f12. So this corresponds to the additive effect with respect to the dimension 1, dimension 2, and then interaction between 1 and 2. So you see that we can decompose f, this function f, exactly as a sum of a function that depends on no variable, a function that depends on the first, and depends a function that depends on the second, and a function that depends on both. And so, so that all of these functions are orthogonal in L2. Okay? So, uh, imperfect uh, selected references. This is the paper by Hupting, where in 48, he started to consider this kind of decomposition. Efron and Stein in 81, then Antoniadis in a, a function theoretic setup, and the very well known uh, Ilya Sobol, who published one of his papers in 93 uh, about these uh, indices that rely on this decomposition. So now I propose, since we want to apply this to Gaussian fields and to cast it as operators, that we revisit this approach in a more abstract way. So you take a subspace of the functions from D to R, and then you take uh, a set of commuting projections, Pj, so you have as many projections as you have dimensions, that satisfy some property, which is that Pj of f is equal to f if f does not depend on the j variable, and Pj of f does not depend on xj. Okay, so we start from this. Then the identity operator can be decomposed as a product of i minus pj plus pj. I've done nothing here, okay? This is just an obvious equality. Uh, but then I can expand this product as a sum, as a sum of uh, all the subsets between, uh, of, of indices between 1 and d. And I've got here these projections onto the j's, which are not in u, and here the i minus the projection for the other ones, and I call this product here tu. Okay, so now if you, if you apply this operator, identity operator to f, then you get that f is equal to the sum of fu, with fu being tu of f. And we got an operation, operatorial setup for uh, ANOVA decomposition. This is precisely what has been done in this paper by Kuo et al. Uh, and they have done a lot more in this paper on decomposition of multivariate functions. So we will stick to that setup and somehow consider, allow ourselves to vary a little bit from the ANOVA decomposition. Now, if you take the particular case where the PJs or the partial integration operators this one, then that gives you T U of F, which writes in that way, and you recover exactly the ANOVA decomposition. For example, the decomposition that we saw in the example was derived by taking the constant as the integral of F, and then the additive parts as the partial integrals of F minus the constant. So to get this additive part, you just integrate F with respect to one or the other of the variables, and so on. Here you can decompose, you can create the last term simply by uh, taking the difference. So, now we come back to our GP setup and surrogate modeling setup, and we assume that this function f is very costly to evaluate. And that we want to estimate the ANOVA decomposition of f and the Sobol indices. Because if I come back to this formula, if I want to calculate these guys, I need to integrate, which means I need to evaluate the function a lot of times, which is generally not possible. So the popular workflow in that case is to replace f by some approximation. First, take polynomial or neural network or Gaussian process or uh, any surrogate model for the function f, say f tilde, and do the ANOVA decomposition of f tilde. So this includes 
this works here. So Sudre has done that with polynomial chaos. Waba has done that with smoothing splines. And here we are considering the case of Kriging and GRF or GP models. First, Oakley and O'Hagan have uh, contributed to the topic uh, with a very nice paper, JRSSB in 2004, where they assume a Gaussian <coughs> random field prior for F. And they have calculated analytically the, the posterior means of the ANOVA terms. Uh, and even if the paper is, is really uh, a, a very great paper, there are a, a few drawbacks. The posterior means are computed by multidimensional numerical integration, so there still is something expensive about the way it's done. The kernel that they use by default is a stationary Gaussian, and there the Sobel indices are estimated through a ratio of posterior means. So you have, you remember you had a ratio of norms or square norms, they take the posterior mean of the numerator divided by the posterior mean of the denominator as an estimator of the ratio, which is something we can question. Then, in 2009, uh, Marel and co-authors have proposed to investigate the posterior distribution of the Sobel indices by taking draws of the Gaussian process. So basically, you simulate F conditional on the observations and for each of the paths, you calculate all the integrals you need numerically to get uh, realizations of SU. Okay, so indices are simulated. Uh, the TU of Z are numerically approximated. Kernel K is chosen among uh, stationary uh, covariance kernels. The approach was tested on a 20-dimensional <coughs> test case with some very nice results. Uh, but the links between the kernel K and the Sobel indices are not discussed. So now you see me coming. Um, in the first part of the talk, we were focusing on designing kernel K. And now we are speaking about applying sensitivity analysis on a GP model. And then I'm starting to wonder what is the relationship? How can I choose K if I want to do sensitivity analysis? Maybe I don't want to choose an arbitrary K. Okay, so this is uh, back to the test function. Uh, we apply, we do conditional simulations based on a couple of uh, observation points. So this is the GRF model, this is the simulations, and then we can, we can look at the Sobel indices. So here you see uh, you have a very spread distribution for the, the Sobel indices. Well, this one is not that spread, which basically uh, uh, which is ba basically a consequence of the fact that you don't know the function well. Now comes Nicolas. And Nicolas, in 2013, <coughs> proposed to use so-called ANOVA kernels, kernels of that form. So kernels that write as a product of one plus a one-dimensional kernel over the dimensions. And he realized that if you take k naught here to be a zero mean kernel that we saw before, then the Fanova decomposition of the Kriging mean can be calculated without any numerical integration. So you get the expectation of the, the Fanova decomposition for free if you take a kernel of that kind. So we start seeing the link between kernels and Fanova decomposition. And you can even get the Sobel indices of the Kriging mean in the closed form formula with this kind of kernels. So this is something that was published in, in 13. And the question I want to, okay, so this is, this is what you get analytically. So with the formula of Nicola, you can get these terms here uh, without any numerical integration or, or, or Monte Carlo, just a, as, as, a, as a tractable analytical formula. But this is about the mean. This doesn't give you exactly the distribution. So assume that F is a realization of a Gaussian, fi uh, of a Gaussian random field Z with kernel K. Goes with implicit assumptions concerning the ANOVA decomposition. This is our claim. 
And the questions that we want to tackle in the remaining minutes, three minutes, how can we, how the different FANOVA terms are distributed? What is the interplay between the FANOVA decomposition and K? How does the conditioning on data affect the FANOVA decomposition of a GRF? And maybe what consequences for Sobol indices estimation under our GRF prime? So let me give you another view of the remaining slides. The first thing is that you can apply the decomposition to the field. You can say, I, am a, I have my operators TU. Let's plug in the decomposition and say that Z is equal to the sum of TU of Z. Then you obtain that the TU of Z are also Gaussian processes, which covariant structure is given by the tensor product of TU with itself applied to K. So basically, it means that if you take... Hmm. Let's try to find some room. So if you take uh, a FANOVA decomposition where you have the constant term, then you have some additive part, then you have some second order interaction, then you have higher order interaction. So I would need to, to do a larger square. Then you will have a covariance between the constant term and itself. You will have uh, covariance between the additive part and itself, and so on. And so you will have a, a kind of table of different subkernels that correspond with tensor product projections. Moreover, coming back to the multitask Gaussian process setting, if you consider all the terms of the decomposition at once, they define a 2 to the power d dimensional vector valued random field, and this guy here is giving you the cross covariances. So the way the constant and the additive part vary, or the way the additive and the interaction part vary, are cross-correlated, and the cross-correlation are given by that. Now you can apply this. Uh, let's let, yeah. Let's let's derive that for a very simple case. Take the Brownian motion. Take a Brownian motion. It, it's a zero, zero mean Gaussian process with kernel k of s t is equal to mean of s t. Then you can say b t is equal to its integral plus the center part bt minus its integral. Then you can say, okay, I'm going to calculate the covariance kernel of that part. Well, this is just a random variable, so the covariance kernel will be just a number, um, basically. So you calculate this and you get one third. Then you can also look at the covariance kernel of this center part. The covariance kernel of this center part gives you this formula. So this is the covariance kernel of a centered Brownian motion, basically. If you simulate with this, you will have centered path steaming from the Brownian motion, more or less. And then if you apply the cross covariances, well, I, don't, I think I don't have the example of on these slides. Oh yes, I do have them. Then you get this formula that tells you to what extent the constant part and the centered part are cross correlated. Okay, so you have intrinsically some, uh, the, the, the kernel K is giving you not only how the different FANOVA terms are distributed, but how they are cross-correlated. So let me jump to some uh, last results. Once you have established that, then you can check easily that TU tensor TU applied to K is equal to zero if and only if TU of Z is equal to zero with probability one, which means that you can check and impose the sparsity of a random field by playing on the kernel. So if you want a kernel not to have a second order interaction between x2 and x3, then you can just remove the part of the kernel that corresponds with this projection here. So you have a kind of algebra that you can do on the, on, on the space of kernels mm -hmm. using these tensor products and operators in order to get to emphasize more or less uh, these are those parts of the signal somehow. And then you have this, also the, the fact that TU tensor CV of K is equal to zero if and only if these two contributions of the FANOVA decomposition are independent. Something really interesting, which we, it took some time to realize, but once you have established it's really simple to grasp, is that this uh, getting data, if you have a kernel that has this property here, so for instance, you have no interaction between x1 and x2, and you acquire data, and the data tells you exactly the, the, the opposite. 
you see in the data that there is obviously an interaction between X, X1 and X2, and then it will never change. It will <coughs> never change. This is the corollary. If you ha acquire some data at n points, whatever n, whatever the points, the sparsity of Z with respect to the operator TU is preserved by condition, which means the conditional probability of TUZ is equal to zero, is equal to one, whatever the set of observed values. So if you choose a wrong kernel, you will have it forever. You will never compensate for the wrong structure in your FANOVA decomposition. Okay. So a bit of spectral stuff, skip it. I will jump to the conclusions. Um, Okay, so about the CANOVA, CANOVA decomposition is the name we gave to this kernel ANOVA decomposition where I, well, I couldn't find <laughs> a way to, to plot it properly, but we, we, we have a number of good references I didn't have time to quote uh, in, the, in the preprint, uh, which is currently in revision, and also a 30-dimension numerical experiment. This is a uh, controlled numerical experiment with GP simulations. Back to the invariances and degeneracy results, I think the take-home message is really the following. T of Z is equal to zero almost surely if and only if T tensor T of K is equal to zero. In other, way, in, in, in other terms, if you have an invariance or a mathematical property in your system that you know in advance and you can cast it as being is in the kernel or in the sense of operators of some operator T, then you can impose it on your GP by imposing that on your kernel. And finally, the ongoing perspectives uh, include investigating analytical and automatic approaches to derive and tune kernels that incorporate degeneracy and invariances. For instance, doing an ANOVA decomposition where you estimate the different terms, using them for prediction, feature extraction, and maybe more will depend on you probably. Thank you very much. We certainly have time for questions while they're setting up lunch. So, so would you for example say that if you if you have some environment that you can make it clear of, then you can get a group of kernels and that can help you to automatically choose from the group of kernels? Is this something that you work to do? We have just started, so we. Yes. Okay. So, I will try to summarize it. Uh, have we used this principle of invariances to choose kernels, basically based on the on data? So, what we have considered for now is, for instance, the case where you have an axis of symmetry that depends on of some angle. You know, the data is more or less symmetrical up to some noise, and you want to find the the parameters of the axis of symmetry by maximum likelihood. And it turned out to work on our example quite well. But you need to know in advance what is the form of the invariance. Now you can imagine, and I think that David Duvno and his co-authors have also some very nice viewpoint on the, on the question that you have a dictionary, a very big dictionary yeah, of kernels. You're assuming that you can have a group, but it was not group defined by any type of invariances. It was just a set of like simple kernels that you can add and multiply and therefore you can have a group and you can have like zero and one but that was mm. not based on any invariant, invariant property so the question was was whether we can do something if you have a group of kernels which are not necessarily invariant from the beginning and i think it's important if you want to incorporate invariances that you uh, somehow go beyond the addition multiplication framework and that you allow warpings that you allow uh, invariance opera operations, symmetrization of your kernel and stuff like this inside of the permitted operations of your dictionary. And, that, and then you have a much larger dictionary and you can figure out if by some multiple kernel procedures you can pick the right one or a combination of the right ones. But if you can recover invariances by standard kernels, I, I have doubts. So uh, you mentioned a paper by Oki and O'Hagan, yes. they perform sensitivity analysis, and you said that they use a stationary kernel. I think so. Yeah. So would you say that if we are trying to approximate the function with a GP, 
with the purpose of performing sensitivity analysis, we should use on a novel kernel in the GP. Okay, the, the, the question is whether we should use stationary kernels or ANOVA kernels, for instance, if we want to perform sensitivity analysis. Um, that depends on, on what you think on the function f. If you have good reasons to believe that the stationary kernel is, is, is performing well, uh, then you can use it. But the price to pay is that your Sobel indices are not analytically tractable. While if you take the ANOVA kernels, probably you're imposing some kind of structure you might not want to impose, but you've got the benefit of the tractability. So this is a trade-off. But I think they are quite, uh, quite flexible family. This is something we need to investigate. To what extent we can do with and without. A, a brief comment you just rem um, remind me of uh, a reconciliation. The reason why <coughs> that sensitivity analysis in the, the Oakley and O'Hagan paper is because they're doing computer model emulation. So their inputs to that model are the parameters that they choose to run that model at. Just like when you do optimization, you put the parameters in. So the re it's the same thing I said sensitivity analysis was, but it's just the inputs to the model are the model parameters. And then it's rather than doing sensitivity analysis on the original model, moving the parameters around, they have a separate Gaussian process that they do sort of analytic sensitivity analysis of, I think. Um, so that's why the sensitivity analysis, the meaning's the same, but it looks a lot like feature selection now because it's on a Gaussian process model. So it's, uh, that, that's where the terms come back together. Sorry, I just wanted to point out what I thought. There was also one question here. Yeah, well. Okay, please. How, how legitimate or illegitimate would you find it if one would just translate this take home message to the regularity of the kernel is transferred to the regularity of the sample parts of the Gaussian motion created by this kernel? Is this a very illegitimate simplification? Or uh, do you think this heuristic could work? So the question is about the legitimacy of translating the regularity of the kernel of the path in terms of regularity of the kernel and if my take home message is, is somehow related to that. I'm, okay, so regularity is, is a bit ambiguous here. What do you mean exactly by regularity? If regularity means differentiability, then... I, uh, well, I have not tried to encode differentiability as something like this. Mm -hmm. Here what I'm saying is <coughs> the derivative is equal to zero. I'm not saying it exists, right? right? Mm -hmm. Oh, right, yeah. Okay, so probably these are related questions but not exactly coinciding. Okay, so so one, one should think about which like properties can be encoded as, let's say, an operator. Yes. And these as the subset of properties which I can translate. To. Yes. And not, and not every property can be translated. Encoded as Definitely. So there are a number at uh, okay, the question is about mono monotonicity. There are a number of attempts to incorporate monotonicity in GPs for operational reasons because there are many codes where you know in advance that the response will react monotonically with one input. I think if you want to do that, it's like the question on the Lipschitz constant. You have to step out of the Gaussianity. You can, so there, there I know some people who have worked on that uh, based on models which depart slightly from Gaussianity. For instance, by 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 imposing, I mean, by changing the model slightly. Mm -hmm. If you take a Gaussian process and you condition it on on points, and you want that you have monotonicity properties at that at those points, then you're still Gaussian. But no, if if you impose given values for the points which are uh, honoring the monotonicity, you're still Gaussian. But if you impose something which is much more complex, which is the monotonicity on the path, you step out of Gaussian. Yeah, this is a, 
It's a really interesting one because it's a constraint that comes up a lot, but it's also equivalent to a positivity constraint because sort of in effect, positivity, it's positivity on the derivative. And you know that these things are jointly Gaussian. Um, there's a nice trick actually that Aki Batari has used um, for doing this in um, uh, sort of survival models, which is to make a binary observation of the gradient constraining it positive. So like a classification. So you have to augment. You can't constrain these things monotonic because they can always go negative. It's like using like a Gaussian density for our heights. You know, in theory, it's got some support for negative heights, no matter how, how, uh, you know, how unlikely that is. And this is why you can't do monotis monotonicity or positivity because marginally you always have some support for going negative. Exactly. So in practice, what you do is you can augment things. You can augment the system with additional data that says, well, it could go negative. It's still jointly Gaussian. So you either have to go non-Gaussian, as David said, or you have to sort of say, well, I'll put some data in that forces my posterior to, to sort of stick to these constraints in practice. And, and Archie Vitari has a really nice idea that I haven't tried, but we keep wanting to try and implement in GPI, which is augment your model with derivative observations and then do classification observations of those derivative observations that say they're positive. So where you put them, then you have to have a design choice about where you put them. So for example, if you see a gradient dropping down, you need to sort of add an observation that says no. So what you, you typically get is if it, you know, you've got monotonic data, obviously, but it can drop and then go up. Or oh, sorry, drop. <laughs> and then what you need to do is say, add an observation that say no. Gradient here must be positive, and then you'll get a correction. It'll never be, it'll, it'll be the Gaussian projected back to the Gaussian process, it'll never be the actual thing. But you basically, it's, it's one of those things, you just, in theory, you can't do it, you have to approximate. So, the comment. Uh, I've the got a question? couple of references afterwards, if you want, on this topic. Yeah, the problem once you do the transformed space, so that's, that's, what, that's an excellent suggestion. And so you can do things like that. So if you want things to be positive, you could do model in the, you know, do the exponentiation or a log link. But now the derivative of that space is no longer a Gaussian process. And very often, you, when you do these things, you want to do in two in parallel. So a classic one is you want to fit Antonio Hagen and, uh, has, has done a lot of this with, is it Mark Kennedy? Um, you want to, they do prior elicitation with Gaussian processes. Do you want a Gaussian process that defines a probability distribution? Now you can make an integral observation that forces your process to be across the domain you're interested in integrating to one. That's fine, so that's probability distribution, but now it needs to be positive. Now if you constrain it to be positive, you have to sort of do the exponential transform, but now the integral of the process is no longer a Gaussian process. So you end up, and Mark, Mike Osborne's done a lot of work in these areas, you end up sort of trading off one property against the other. But when you do the transform, so let's see, say we do that transform in order to constrain um, the log of the derivative, yeah, so to constrain the derivative positive, if we now integrate that process, the resulting thing is no longer a Gaussian process anymore. So th th there are definite things that have these properties, but then they don't have the nice process properties of the GP that we like. Um, so you, you can have some of them, but not all of them together. Yeah, David probably has some really good. Points. I have references. If you want, we can discuss afterwards. I also have a comment about these uh, adding these observations. Doesn't that screw up the predictive variance? Well, not if you do it. Um, I don't think so in the way that Archie is doing it. I think that if you're adding an observation that is a, a regression observation, so if you're saying the function's here, um, that does. No, no, this isn't this. You're adding an observation that says the gradient of that function is constrained. So you do a classification observation. And, and you use EP or something like that, like Alan was talking about yesterday. So or you add an observation, so in the positive space, if this was like you're trying to constrain the function positive and it's gone negative here, you just add an observation here that says the function is somewhere in this half space. That's like a classification observation, right? It's saying that I, I, I have binary observation here. So now it's free to move anywhere up there. So you will affect things, but only to the degree of that you're avoiding dropping down below. So that's quite, a, that's a really, Elegant and obvious one, Archie said it. It's one of those things, Archie says it, and you're like, oh yeah, of course that's what one should do. Um, but before that, I hadn't sort of thought that was email. But so you, you know, there are, there are some works on monotonic splines, for instance. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting too. So yeah. how you then relate those, because people who know splines will then say, oh, but what does this mean if I put it in a Non-Gaussian. Yeah, non-Gaussian. Well, is it non-Gaussian, or is it that the mean function is monotonic? The posterior mean, I don't know, I've not really fully understood. 
Well, the equivalent because in terms of GP would be non-Gaussian, I guess. But because you, you could envisage cases where you set things up such that your posterior mean is monotonic. Yeah, yeah. The re but the samples that come from it would not necessarily be monotonic. Sure. So there's sure. two aspects to that. It's like much easier yeah, to constrain yeah. the posterior mean function to be monotonic. So you'll find kernel methods where the kernel method has a monotonic function. It's harder to constrain things to be a family of processes over something that will always sample monotonic functions. Um, so spline people are just worrying about the mean function, where we're worrying about all the sample tasks. So you just said about the smoking gradient. No, I was then drawing the gradient. No, for me, I was just drawing a, a sample function. I mean, it's not a strip. I actually changed what the plot was. Initially, it was the function, then it was the derivative of the function. <laughs> Keep up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, 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 be more precise about it. Is Arky's idea is that you make observations, joint observations with your function of the derivative of the function, and then those are classification observations. Um, but then what I was saying is you could do the same trick if you just wanted a positive function in general rather than positive derivative from monotonicity. You could just draw functions and then where it goes negative, make that observation. That isn't how um, uh, Mike Osborne in, and others in their recent work have been doing distributions, but it's something that seems possible. There's just lots of, it gets complicated. Yeah. But I mean, uh, having said that, sorry, um, I, I just wanted to emphasize how I think exciting a lot of the work that uh, David and Nicola have been doing because these sort of constraints that you can, so uh, we just focus too, way too much on the negatives about what you can't do, like the monotonicity and stuff like that. That is a pain. But, but these, these, the imagination that goes into this work in order to be able to introduce all these sort of symmetries and this sort of thing, it just really shows um, uh, what you can do with GPs and it's sort of coming uh, by, you know, when it comes to us by working across fields, which I think is another aspect of Gaussian processes. There's lots of different people coming in. So if we can just thank David for a really great talk. <laughs>